All right, welcome everybody. My name's Scott Meyer. This is Drawing Together with Artist Network, where we meet every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern to draw together. Each week, we choose a new subject designed to challenge us uh, in particular ways so that we're developing specific skills and advancing our artistic practice. We're taking time out of our busy lives to, to draw. So welcome, everybody. I love seeing all the familiar names and uh, where everybody is viewing from. If you are new, uh, this is all about, again, us drawing together, sharing our ideas about drawing, asking questions. Um, I'll talk through my own process, but feel free to incorporate your own. Uh, and, and again, feel free to ask any questions that you'd like of either of me or anybody in the audience. Um, feel free to make any observations about my own work um, and to help me improve as well. So this is about an exchange of ideas uh, and thoughts about drawing. Uh, you'll find a link to the reference image in the description below. You'll also find a link on artistnetwork.com where you can share your work when you're done. So there have been some fantastic drawings with the Michelangelo copy. Uh, in particular, that was a really a solid one. Um, and in the vases that we did last week, the, the white charcoal on the black surface, that was so much fun. So check those episodes out if you, um, if you missed those. So this is episode 137, so we've been doing a lot of these. Uh, if you are just new, you can jump in on any one of those. You'll find the full list of them in the playlist on YouTube. So be sure to like, subscribe, do all those things and set up notifications so that you are alerted. Uh, when the next one comes up. So again, we meet every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, if you are new, shout out where you are viewing from because that is so much fun. We get people from all over the world. So, um, all right, let's get to it. Shaking things up a little bit. I am working on this drawing here, man's profile, and I chose to do it in pen. This is only the second time I've worked with pen for this series, and so... <laughs> It's a lot of fun, but I felt like, all right, it's time to shake things up, try a different medium. Um, and this turned out to be a lot of fun. And I want to talk through some of the things that I discovered in doing this preliminary sketch. Um, I will also talk through the materials that I'm working with. So this paper is this here. It's this Strathmore uh, toned gray paper. This is the 9 by 12 size that I'll be working on. Um, uh, you, you, so again, you'll find that reference image that's below me on the screen. Uh, you'll find that in the in the description below. You'll find a link to a larger uh, image of that. So um, for uh, pencils here, I have a just a two H regular um, pencil. Actually, for this one, I just used the yellow number two. So any pencil will do. Um, I found it really helpful in terms of laying out the initial marks. And in, instead of white charcoal, I was experimenting with just this. This is a Derwent Lightfast colored pencil. Um, it worked really well with this and actually found that it, it, it um, kind of merged with the pen lines really nicely. So that's what I'm working on. But I think if, if you have, again, this will work with hopefully in, in any medium. Um, so don't feel like you have to have exactly what I'm working with. Uh, and then I chose to work with these three different line makers, uh, again, made by Derwent. Uh, so I have the sepia, I have a black, and then I have a gray. Um, the, the, the sepia and the gray are the ones I'm going to be using most. And these are the 0 0.3, kind of a mid-range size. Um, and then the, the black one, this is the only one I could find, and it's the 0 0.05, so it's very fine. I wish I had found the 0 0.3 in the dark. Um, but I, I, uh, I gave it to my son and I couldn't find it. <laughs> so I, this is the one I could find because um, he really likes these and I like them as well. Um, all right. Yeah. So I, I just, again, I chose to use just a regular yellow number two pencil to lay things out. Um, what I did here is I, you could see that I started the initial sketch. It's so light on this gray paper though that um, what I want to do is kind of walk you through the process here on the white paper so it just shows up better, but you can see some of the things that I was thinking about in terms of getting that layout done. Because it's kind of broken into two stages, using the, the graphite to, to essentially set the groundwork for it, and then using the, the pens to help bring it to completion, um, further refine it, and in particular, really focus on structure. Um, using cross hatching, dimensional hatching, um, parallel hatching, we'll cover all of those terms if you're not familiar with them. But there are things that we've covered um, recently, especially in some of the master copy series when we talked about Degas' work, for example, or Michelangelo's work. 
um, both using both dimensional and directional hatching or parallel hatching um, in their work. So we'll, again, we'll talk through that. So, so those are all entirely new terms. Stick around and and we'll cover all of that. Um, so uh, let's get to it. If you do have any questions, uh, feel free to, to you know, call them out. Uh, if you type them in all caps, I'm more likely to see them and hopefully I don't miss anything. Um, uh, let's see. Looks like we are good to go. Uh, oh, sorry, Leslie, that you don't have the gray, but hopefully this will this will work out just fine, and or we can you can kind of come back to this later. Um, all right, let's get to it. So with the layout, um, as we talk about with with really any drawing, my my general philosophy that all drawing is gesture drawing. We're just continually refining gestures. It all starts with this gesture. Um, so kind of reacting to the initial form, thinking about the layout. Holy smokes, it's really bright. Um, let me drop this down. It, it totally adjusts the, the exposure on the camera, so I got to play around with that a little bit. I'm going to be a little bit heavier handed so that you can see it uh, more easily on the, the page. I prefer to use an overhand grip. Uh, and as I get these marks on the page, I will then kind of talk through what they what they mean. But you know, for those of you that have been uh, with me for a while, uh, know that this early stage of gesture drawing is all about getting marks on the page, uh, and then from this we'll be able to react to it um, and make specific changes with regards to the proportions, um, angles placement on the page, et cetera. Uh, so the, the big thing in this is really capturing this profile. So what I'm looking for initially is just reacting to the main shapes that I'm seeing, in particular the nose um, and that forehead. Uh, you know, I'm noticing the, uh, the particular angle, the axis for the eyes, the axis for the mouth. Uh, and I want to talk through, um, as we get through this, um, some things that can be helpful in terms of seeing the perspective on a um, on a profile view like this. Uh, we, we haven't done much of this in the series when we're working with portraiture, um, but it can really make for a dynamic image, uh, but it, it can also be really tricky in part because we have to override so much of our our, our own kind of instincts uh, in, in our practiced drawings of maybe, when we've done three-quarter views or straight-on portraits, we get kind of familiar with a certain set of proportions that as we turn the head farther become uh, just more challenging. That's, that's, what, that's what I find uh, with, the, uh, with, a, um, with a profile view like this. Okay, so with some just initial marks on here, uh, kind of thinking through that I want this to all be kind of relatively dark the face turns into the light, and I can kind of darken this side. That's really all I'm thinking about is just some basic structure at this stage. Um, uh, let's see, yeah, you can use any paper, um, you know, for this. I chose to work on the toned paper for this final, this final version uh, that I'll be working on, but um, yeah, again, this is hopefully everything that is being covered in this show will it will translate to any other medium that you're working with, at least provide you some help with whatever medium that you currently have. Um, all right, thank you, Jen, for posting the link to the Degas master copy there. Um, uh, Brenda, you're working with colored pencils. I think this will actually work out really well because colored pencils um, kind of lend themselves to working with a fine point the way you might with a pen. So using that cross-hatching could become uh, really valuable. Okay, so... With the, the, basic, the basic gesture established, we start to refine it. And the first step I'm going to do uh, take here is to um, work with some angle sighting. So what that means is, is I'm looking at the overall angles of the main structure of the head, breaking down curves into sequences of shorter, straighter marks not getting sucked into any of the nuances of those curves at this point. I want to get the overall um, kind of movement of those curves figured out. And to help you with that, again, if you're new to this, this, this is a really helpful tool that we use in almost every drawing. 
If you close one eye, it flattens your depth perception. And then holding your pencil out in front of you, it makes it feel like that pencil is directly on top of your subject. And you can align your pencil with a, an angle that you're targeting in that subject. So in this case, if I'm looking at the slope of the nose, closing one eye, I can align the pencil so that it aligns with this slope on the reference. I lock my wrist. I place it directly on top of the drawing. So what I'm looking in front at in front of me is the overhead projection of the of the or the overhead capture of the camera, uh, so I'm seeing what you're seeing on the screen now, and I can compare the angle, and it looks like it's lining up pretty well. Now the advantage that I have in this setup is I can see my drawing and the small thumbnail reference adjacent to one another. So when I'm looking at the reference image in my peripheral vision, I can be comparing the basic angle, the slope of the nose to what's happening in the drawing. I can see the movement of my pencil. I can move my eyes back and forth and compare the two to see if anything stands out as being noticeably off at this point. And then we're going to gradually correct them. Uh, and I can just simply move through this drawing, making adjustments to the overall proportions. And again, I, I did this on the drawing below already, um, but because it doesn't show up so well on camera, I'm doing it on this white paper for so you can really kind of see the see the steps that I took on the gray. So we'll we'll shift to the gray in a little bit. Um, now let's see. I'm I'm noticing here with the beard, it's not a a solid structure so I can change my marks. I don't have to be quite as precise with them. Um, I'm also starting to notice distinct shapes of light and shadow. So I want to start to indicate that. Primarily in the nose, um, we can see light striking along the bridge of the nose, uh, the, that ridge, and then it turns into shadow. And there's somewhat of a definable shape that I can lock onto here. So I'm going to start to indicate that. And now I can start to see the, the brow and the nose kind of turning up around that forehead. And then what's helpful in this area here where we're seeing just that upper eyelid. We're not even seeing any of the eyeball. We're just seeing that eyelid extending out over the eyeball that's being obscured by the nose here. Um, what can be helpful is to try to think of this as an abstraction. Um, and what I mean by that is try to strip away any sort of previous understanding you have of what an eye should look like, right? As soon as we label something, it floods our mind, or perhaps our mind is already flooded with these images and is applying the label, but there's something that happens in the mind when we've labeled it that um, can sometimes prevent us from really seeing the shapes that are in front of us. And so by, by trying to get rid of that, don't think I... Don't think any sort of previous drawing you've done of an eye. Just look at that shape and try to identify what is this shape? How big is it? What are the angles? How does it relate to some of the other forms? Um, that is, that's really the heart of abstraction is stripping away kind of the language that we apply to our subject and just thinking about it as raw data, as colors, shapes, lines, textures, et cetera, things like that. Um, now, with that, I can also see kind of an implied axis between these eyes. Um, and you can use your pencil, uh, as, as you did with angle sighting, to envision that axis and see that there's a, a general slope there. Um, what we notice, though, that as we come down, that slope seems to change uh, for each of the, the main features. So the axis for the eyes is um, kind of set at one angle. Um, we can imagine the axis for the nose as being largely horizontal, as kind of being obscured by the, a downward slope of the nose. And then there's an angle for the mouth that comes down somewhat. Uh, it's, slight, it's mostly horizontal, but slightly angled downward. 
Um, and I want to get back to that later, but paying, paying attention to that um, can be really helpful because this is that's what ultimately establishes our proximity to the subject, how close we are to the subject. The more a variation between these angles here, the closer we are. Um, the, the less variation, the farther we feel from it. And I'll, again, I'll try to give some additional tools that, that I kind of have running through my head. Um, but we want to just be mindful of that um, as we're going through and just kind of taking a mental note of the variation between those axes. Um, and now we can look at, uh, again, the abstraction and the shape of this eye. Eyes are really tricky because they're objects that we typically start drawing at a young age. Um, if they, they, we form a, a symbolic understanding of a, the structure of the eye very early on. Um, and that can be a challenge to override and really observe the specific qualities of this individual eye. Um, and so practicing observing the abstract quality of these shapes can be really helpful. So what I mean by that is if I look at this overhanging eyelid here, trying to observe this largely triangular form, we see that carry down at a slight angle, slight curve down to this thin wedge here. I'm not going to label it as an eyelid. I'm going to label it as those shapes. Um, I can look at an angle here that in general has a downward slope, um, but it has a curve to it. So I can get that overall slope and then I can break that up into different segments. Um, I see it getting darker under here. And there's a distinct change in planes as we, as we transition along this edge here, where then it comes out like this. Um, we, see a, we see a form here that overlaps this line. We see a plane that emerges down here underneath it. So all of that is contributing to the structure of the eyeball without thinking about it as an eyeball, just thinking about it as edges, about as planes, um, as values. Um, and this is, you know, we've talked about that a lot in the show here. Having an understanding of anatomy can be really helpful, um, but without it, you can get so far and you can learn so much about anatomy by looking at the human form as an abstraction, right? And really looking at as the specific qualities of the individual subject um, as opposed to kind of generalized or kind of practiced motions for drawing the figure. Um, now, as I stay in this area here, I become aware of the, the central axis along the forehead and the placement there. And I want to kind of, again, talk through that a little bit as well. Um, and maybe this is a good time for it. So I can, can, I'll come back to that. But the, to help you with finding that central axis, I want to kind of talk through some basics of perspective and the way planes shift a bit. Um, Let's see. I'm just. I'm not seeing any questions here, um, but it, okay. But if I miss anything, please let me know. Um, so, let's see. If say if we're look, if we're talking about the forehead, and if we were to try to s visualize a concept um, that we could relate that to, we could. If we we can think about a a, a rectangular form. I'm actually maybe I'm going to turn this sideways. Um, so if we draw a, a rectangle, we're looking straight on at it. If we, if we draw a line that connects the opposing corners, that place where it intersects defines the center of that. So we could 
think about the forehead as something similar to that. Imagine, you know, that it has defined edges. If you were to kind of connect the opposing corners, there's, we would find that we could find the center there. You know, of course, the forehead is a much more complex form. But if we were to take that, that rectangle and put it in perspective, what you might see is something like this. All right, so now that rectangle has been drawn in perspective. If we extend these off, they would, uh, these edges would, would appear to meet at a, a common point off in the distance. But we can find perspective center by, again, connecting the opposing corners. Uh, if you look at this now, that central axis is pushed off to the left. So when following the rules of perspective, the, 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 the area, the side <laughs> that's closest to us is going to feel larger than the area that's receding away from us. So um, we could, without any perspective applied to this rectangle, we can find the central two ways. We can connect these opposing corners and then through that central axis, run a vertical line, or we could simply measure in the, the, the space on to the left and the right of that central line is equidistant. We can no longer do that once we apply perspective to that rectangle. We can only use the, this technique of, of the opposing corners or, or visualize it, but we can't measure the distance between the left and the right sides, divide it by two, and find the center. Um, so what's helpful as you build an intuitive understanding of that, when we apply that to this, um, this forehead, for example, you can start to see that general shape of the rectangle forming, right? Um, and you can see that, you know, if we were to look at the placement of the eyes, the center of that forehead, um, because of the perspective of the forehead, that central axis is much closer to this side than it is over, over on this side. So we, again, we could come back here and we could say, all right, well the, maybe the nose falls down in the center. We, we have eyeballs um, placed here. If we were to do that same here, now we have the nose kind of coming down this side. We've got to fit one eyeball off to the left between the center and the left side of this rectangle, and then another over here. You can see there's a big scale difference between these shapes. Hopefully this is making somewhat sense. So if I'm not making any sense, please let me know. Um, let's see. So I don't use a lot of perspective when I'm working with uh, a portrait, but having a basic intuition for finding the center of an object that's receding away from you can be really helpful. So that's the really the big thing that I want to shout out is, is that locating that center um, and finding the, the perspective center uh, relative to the, the basic shape that you're defining there. Um, so hope, again, hopefully that makes sense. Um, now we, we also have, again, we have an axis here for the, this eye that we can define. Um, as we come down here, again, we can kind of visualize the nostril here. If we, could, if we were able to view this no, nose as transparent, we would see that other nostril somewhat basically over here. Um, and the, the line here connecting them would be largely horizontal. And then as we move down here, um, because it's below our eye level to a slight degree, it's going to change just slightly. Actually, it, it might be this, I might have that off a little bit. Maybe this is a slight incline and this is really largely horizontal, but there's a difference between the angle here, here, and here. Um, so I, I would actually kind of level out the mouth, make that horizontal, apply a slight an angle to this, the bottom of the nostril, and a, a steeper angle for the eyes. Um, again, I think it's most useful to really develop an intuitive understanding of that rather than construct the portrait through rigid rectangles and things like that. So the, hopefully that makes sense for why I incorporated um, this bit of discussion here to the portrait. So um, 
Excellent. Now, I'm getting some feedback that it's working. Another thing to be aware of are where the major turns are. So the forehead is largely kind of curved, but it's there's a flatness to it as well. Um, and then we make a turn here along the forehead. It's not a vertical axis. It's kind of a diagonal. Um, just kind of thinking out loud here, looking for that central axis. Um, and then we see this really interesting structure here with the cheek. Um, where we see, again, this kind of bulging out, we see a shadow forming here. And we're going to really dig into the, the light and shadow effect with the, um, with the pen later on. This kind of falls into shadow, so we see a general light. This side it turns into, it's turning away from the light here, so that's more in shadow. This... We see a small shadow here where we see a bit of the ridge on the eye socket, kind of at the cheekbone. Um, it's a little bit fleshier here, turning into shadow here. And then I'm going to have this all transition into shadow down in here. So again, if you're joining, what this, what I'm doing now is I'm demonstrating what I did on this to get this initial drawing laid out, but it doesn't show very well here. Um, this is all shaded in here. And we're going to talk a lot about hatching for this show, how to build up shading through hatching. Um, now for uh, for this drawing here, I also kind of refined it a little bit farther. With these major shapes established, I can go in and uh, and add a, another level of specificity to the this profile along in here. And start to observe some of these kind of creases in the forehead that I'm going to lightly describe at this stage, but I'm going to let the, the pen and the ink do more of the work later on. But I want to give myself a little bit more information. Uh, this is a really interesting area here structurally, so I want to spend time with that in the final drawing. So in this early stage, I'm going to take note of the, the kind of the interlocking planes these kind of triangular shapes that all kind of work together. There's a kind of a convergence in this area where these lines all kind of meet as extensions in the corner of the eye. Um, there's a more noticeable shape here that I can define for the eyebrow. And this really kind of rounds out. So there's a lot of, a lot of this is kind of thinking through the drawing process, Be, you know, becoming aware of the structure and allowing the marks to form somewhat naturally. And then this becomes a really distinct shadow shape here that I'm observing. Uh, this becomes a distinct shadow shape. Uh, and becoming aware of all of the, the subtle variations in the overall plane of the nose. So this is generally one plane, but within that it's broken up. Again, we'll, we're going to cover a lot of this when we get into the pen and ink. I'll talk through the hatching strategy. Right now, I'm not thinking about that too much. I'm just kind of reacting to the form and trying to block in these share areas of light and shadow. So this is all in shadow, but the light's hitting a little bit more on this nostril. 
there's really a distinct sh shadow shape under here. We see actually a line for the nostril. Um, and I'm not drawing that as an oval or an ellipse. That And there's, I can feel my brain wanting to do that because that's the way I think nostrils are. They're the, think of them as ellipses or ovals. And, but from this point of view, it's not that shape. And it really turns away from the light here. And for those of you who watched last week's episode with the vases, one of the things we talked a lot about were the turning edges. Um, and so now we can apply some of those observations to the portrait as well. Um, so where do, how does the, the transition from light into shadow look? Is it a sharp or a gradual transition? Just some notes about the beard. kind of some notes about the direction of the, the cheekbone here in that plane, or not the cheekbone, but the cheeks themselves. And then there's a whole lot of whole lot of hair happening here <laughs> in that beard. That's going to be a lot of fun to figure out. Um, so the, the strategy here is let my eyes lose focus, do a lot of squinting, and just try to see overall shadow shapes. So then what we observe is, again, that turning from light into shadow um, as we wrap around the mouth. But there's no real clearly defined lines or edges. Um, and that pretty much gets us to where I was at with the on the the toned paper underneath that we could start building from um, and you know, incorporating the pen and ink. Um, just kind of letting, I really like in the reference photo the way the forehead kind of falls into shadow and the figure kind of emerges from that shadow. So I like the idea of softening that edge, bringing out a sharper edge as we come down in here and into that nose. Um, just thinking through how I want to turn the edge here on the forehead so I need to be careful with that. So again, just I'm just kind of thinking out loud some of the observations I'm making now at this stage that I may have to become aware of more uh, acutely as, as the, the drawing progresses. All right, and then I, I do want to kind of make note here of the... Um, some of these creases and the, the, the the directionality of some of these shadows. And then we have, you know, a little bit of light striking there, light striking the edge of the hair. I don't know how much of that I want to incorporate yet. Okay. So there's kind of my rough sketch. And again, that's kind of where I'm at with this drawing. But of course, it's so much darker. Um, and, and with the graphite on the gray, it's not showing up so, so well. So I hopefully, hopefully this makes sense. If anybody needs to see this preparatory sketch a little bit longer, let me know. Um, let's see. All right, so let's get to it. I'm going to work with the sepia. There's a warmth to the reference that I really like. This is the, again, this is the Derwent line maker. It's a 0.3 that I, I, I enjoy. Um, now, one of the things that I want to be kind of mindful of as I develop this drawing 
again, are the edges. You know, I want to make sure that I'm able to turn the edges to create a sense of volume, um, that I'm also creating a sense of light and shadow. So I'm my approach is to try to sneak up on the contours a little bit more. I'm not going to just simply outline um, the contours that I have here. I want to start from the center of the form and try to find the contour edges. Um, and if you're not familiar with those kind of terms, there's some terms that I want, I'll be using throughout this drawing that I, I want to make sure you're familiar with. So when I'm talking about contour, what, that, what a contour line is, is it represents the edge of a three-dimensional object. So a line like here, for example, is that this that's that line is a contour line representing the edge of a three-dimensional object. An outline is different. That is a, simply a two-dimensional mark that encircles a, a form that you want to identify. Um, what we're looking at in here are hatch marks. And when you overlap them at different angles, you get cross-hatching. And those hatch marks do a lot to describe the cross contour of an object, the structure of the object. Um, and so by, by defining the, the shape and the direction of your, your hatch marks, you can really reinforce the three-dimensional quality of the, of the object. Uh, we also have parallel hatching. So these are marks that cross over the border, the edge of an object. It's crossing over that contour, and that helps to create a sense of light and atmosphere. And so you, when you look at artists like Michelangelo or um, Degas, like we did in our master copy series, they, they would combine those two, all right? They would use those interchangeably, and I'll be doing that here as well. Uh, some artists will spend more time focusing on the dimensional hatching and really trying to uh, describe the three-dimensional form. Um, others will rely more heavily on parallel hatching and having more of the marks really running in the same direction. Uh, and I'm going to be somewhere in the middle. And so I'm just kind of putting that out there for you so that you're aware of that as you're going through and that you have a certain level of intention with how you're using your your hatch marks as you're building up the form of your drawing. Um, uh, Heather is saying, I don't have pens like yours. Would a regular rolling ball pen work or a fine point Sharpie? Uh, yes, I think so. Actually, I if if I didn't have these pens, I think I would go with a uh, with a ballpoint pen. I like to really utilize the side, the rolling of the pen to engage the tip differently. A Sharpie um, tends to not really respond quite as well to that in my experience. Um, and, you know, so I'll, I'll do a lot of work. You'll see me where I'm hardly making any mark at all. Um, and then I can just simply roll my wrist and get a more permanent mark as I've kind of built up a rhythm. And I find that I, I get more of that effect with a ballpoint pen um, where you can kind of turn it on its side and it's not engaging the ball and releasing the ink quite as much. Um, and so you might find that a little bit better, at least aligning with the way I work with it. So um, let's see. Oh, Leslie's saying, yeah, the micron pens are, are very similar to these, uh, and those are great, um, those Sakura micron pens. Um, let's see. So now I'm going to get to it. Now I know that I'm going to be able to build up highlights on some of these areas. Um, and to give myself a uh, a, a warm-up, I'm actually going to start in an area up here that's a, there's a little bit less at stake. Um, and I like to warm up with my uh, marks a little bit. The if, if you look at some of these marks that I'm creating here, you can see that there's a little hook on some of these, and some are lifting off nicely. Um, I'm not going to worry too much about that, but that is something that's on my mind. Um, this end here where I'm striking down from the upper right down to the lower left, um, it's landing gently and creating a nice transition. But then I'm stopping short here and creating that little burr on the end of the, uh, that mark. And some, in some cases that can serve me well, some cases I don't want that. So for example, where I have this turning from light into shadow, I want to be careful with how I'm transitioning into that area. I don't want heavy marks on the end here. And so I can either I can flick up and lift up into that, or I can just be really careful about how I'm landing onto the page there. 
So ho hopefully that makes sense. But like this all happens very, very quickly. And there's going to be thousands of kind of marks that you're going to be making on your drawing as you're building up these layers of hatch marks. But I want to be, um, uh, I want to be open about some of the things that I'm thinking about as I'm kind of practicing in an area like this, where this is all going to be um, that that transition into the the dark darkness there. Um, the other thing that I'm contending with right now is that I have it taped down at the top, but not on the bottom, and that's giving me a little bit of trouble because it's lifting right here, um, and that's kind of screwing with my uh, my uh, marks a little bit. And you can see like right here, there's an uneven quality to it. Like I'm a little bit heavier here, a light here. I'm not very consistent with my hatch marks. But that comes through, you know, practice. And that's why we do this. And if I were to, to work with pen more, I would get uh, more consistent with it. I don't know if anybody watches Alfonso Dunn. If you don't know, check out his YouTube channel. Does a lot of pen and ink work. That's amazing. Tremendous control over those hatch marks. A lot of consistency. Um, so again, this is an area that I know I want to kind of build up a sense of atmosphere. And so I'm relatively safe with my marks. I'm not being super precious with the edges. And as I'm going through, I'm also... I'm practicing... Um, pushing and pulling the pen and you because I'm it's moving pretty fast here you're not going to be able to tell so um, as I'm making the as I'm making these marks some of these like this one I'm I'm landing and I'm pushing this way and lifting off and then others I'm really dragging and lifting off this way so I'm kind of changing that up oh that's a heavy mark <laughs> but that's all right um, it's what I like about pen and ink is that there's a permanence to this that that forces you just to kind of live with certain qualities. Um, so I'm just kind of, again, building up some of this tone. And as I'm working towards the eye, I'm going to get more and more precise. Um, let's see. I think I'll start along in here. And uh, observing some of the, the shapes. The, the shadow shapes that are that are forming. Uh, and I'm going to actually hold it a little bit farther back so I engage the side of the pen a little, just a little bit more. And you can see that there's not a whole lot happening when I do that. One of the things that also I've become keenly aware of is the the frustration I have at not being able to rotate the paper. <laughs> and I guess I did that a lot in the preparatory sketch. Um, and I take the approach of really building up in these layers. Of, I kind of consider them washes, um, and these layers of light values that build up on top of one another. Um, and then generally my, my approach to making the marks is I'm locking my wrist and I'm trying to draw from the shoulder more than the wrist because the wrist has a natural curve to it that I, I want to avoid. I want these marks to be relatively straight. Um, so... Oh, Mariana saying so you just got Alfonso's uh, book out of the library. That's awesome. Yeah, I know we'll be, there's an article sometime later this year that'll be coming out in Artist Magazine with him. Um, and Oh, Lindy, this is a 0.3 sepia that I'm working with right now. I do have others here that, but I grabbed the 0.3. I have the 0.5. 
and the point one, but I just chose the point, point three. Um, I don't do enough pen and ink work to really appreciate the differences. And, and so I'm just gonna try to push this as far as I can. Um, now, when I'm working in tighter areas as I get closer to like the, the nose here and um, I'm trying to be more intentional with the, the scooping quality of the mark to, to, um, to avoid really hard or harsh edges. Um, I think what I want to do is I need to give myself a little bit of a landmark. So add a little bit more specificity to that eyeball, and I'll do that one over here as well. And again, I had I've I had worked this all out similar to how I I drew this here. Um, uh, on the paper in advance. And then really with what I find is that this is so much about patience and taking time, being careful. Uh, there's a, a hard edge here. Um, and, I'm, and I'm being mindful of where I want hard edges to be. So I'm, I'm not outlining, I'm not creating any contour lines at this point. I'm just kind of building up these value shapes. Actually, for the eyeball, I'm going to switch to this. This is the graphite. It's a, like kind of a light gray. So it's not quite as dark as the black will be. Uh, what I love about the opportunity that um, pen and ink gives us is that it um, it really be makes me uh, hyper alert to pressure in a way that I can be less focused on in other media. So if I'm working in graphite or charcoal, I have the ability to um, erase, you know, lift off a certain amount of material if I'm too heavy handed. Um, now with, uh, with this, you, I don't really have that ability. So um, I have to be more mindful of that. All right, so as I, let's see. Actually, I, I, was, I felt like I was gonna work over here, but I wanna work here on the nose just a little bit to identify the shadow structure. So here, there's a stronger light, so I'm gonna leave that untouched. And then we fall into shadow here, there's a slight edge. Um, we get a little bit of uh, kind of light striking along in here. And I see the um, I see that that turn along that lower eyelid, but I don't want to outline that. I don't want to create a contour line. I just a few little quick marks will help me to um, describe it. And now this whole area is in shadow. And because of what I said earlier about wanting this transition to be relatively light, I'm gonna prioritize dropping the marks on the right side and lifting up as I go. If that makes sense. So hopefully that hopefully that's visible enough. Actually, what I can do is I can zoom in there. There we go. And I can this, this is all gonna be fairly tight work in here. We'll uh, uh, we'll stay close up.
let's see. Um, and then what, one of the, the, the things that I have to overcome is my natural tendency to get to run away with the marks, <laughs> get kind of hypnotized by the hatch marks. Um, and it stopped really kind of thinking critically about what I'm doing. And so I, I'm going to take the approach of kind of just making a few marks and then moving on and kind of regrouping um, because like, it's just so easy to so easy to get lost in those marks. Uh, and I, and I, I, I'm going to bounce around intentionally um, to help me stay focused. It, and it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but um, bouncing around actually helps me to, uh, to keep uh, alert of the specific qualities that I'm observing and, again, not get absorbed in the simple mark making. Now, as we, as we look at these forms here, what I'm reacting to are the overall shadow shapes that I'm, descri that I'm um, identifying. So the, rather, than, rather than kind of create a, an outline, as I see this, it's got a distinct kind of cut here in the forehead trying to observe that shape, but rather than draw a line that basically creates a contour edge, I'm going to, I'm holding that shape in my mind and then creating it using hatch marks that run in a different direction to it. And trying to, it's a, a very light touch. And right now that feels like it jumps off the page too much, in part because it's not kind of tied together. So these kind of washes of a light, of light fine hatching like that help to unify everything. Um, so we're looking for a, uh, a balance between kind of the variety and you know, adding these details and then unifying them. Uh, and I have a larger reference here that I'm um, referring to, <laughs> hence, uh, hence that being a reference. Um, and so I'm just slowly kind of building up these marks here. And so what you saw me do right there you know, I kind of identified the path for the mark, but that was a dangerous thing because I, I, if I make that line too distinct, it's going to be really hard to unify it. Um, another thing that I'm doing in terms of technique is, again, I'm, I'm trying to not use the wrist to create hatch marks. I'm locking my wrist using the elbow. So I've got to contort myself a little bit. Um, I'm st uh, stabilizing my marks here with this, this pen, with my, my finger here. Um, so, and I'm resting my hand on the page or I'm lifting off with this. So there's some support that my hand is, is giving me. Um, and it is lifting off some of the, the marks. So I need to uh, so, you know, some of that, those initial sketch marks are now disappearing, so I need to indicate them a little bit more before I lose them entirely. So I'm going to go through and kind of find this edge here. This is a, an important one, the cheekbone, um, where the mouth, where I had identified the mouth, and then the I can do a slight contour edge for the nostril here. Um, I mean, again, I'm trying to be mindful of that edge. I don't want a hard edge because um, I can't get it back. If I've gone overboard with a contour edge and I'm not able to round it, then 
it's really hard to come back. But I can always I can always add a line later if I feel like I need to to really emphasize it more. So again, I'm just at this stage of what I'm really doing is just solidifying some of the notes that I had made with graphite so that as my hand, you can see it's picking up some of the graphite here that, um, that I, um, I don't get lost in my drawing. Sorry, I'm just think, focusing a little bit more, so I want to, so I'm, I'm kind of not talking as much as I'd like to. And then we have A strip of hair here. Um, this is all shadow in here. And so to even out some of these washes, you know, I prefer to take multiple passes. You can see that's that's pretty blotchy there. But I know I can go darker with it so that I can make another pass where I target some of the light areas. And start to smooth out some of those gradations. So that's where, I, again, I, I prefer multiple passes of light marks rather than trying to kind of have clearly defined marks right out of the gate. And in that um, is honestly driven by the fact that I don't have as much control over the pen as I would like to. Um, you know, with more practice and with more uh, precision on my marks, I can be more bold with the, the pen. But, uh, you know, aside from the chair drawing that we did months and months ago, I hardly ever work in pen and ink. Um, and, but it's fun when I do it. Um, oh, Leslie's saying we should get a race. I feel ya. Um, I, you know, if, I really wish I could blend. Uh, you, you all know that I, I spend a significant amount of time wiping down a drawing to unify the various elements. And I can't do that. And it's really like frustrating <laughs> in a way. Like, but it's this is the fun part, right? This is why we challenge ourselves. Um, and sometimes embracing a new medium can be a great way to discover new techniques for some familiar media that you may already work with. Um, now, one of the other things that I, I like to identify are um, areas where I can be a little bit more free to kind of just simply make marks so I can, can let myself loose a little bit. So like here on this right side, I, I don't have to be, I'm not really defining a whole lot of, of the structure of the head. Um, and that's helpful to have, you know, kind of a release valve, you know, because when I get into the eye structure more, it's going to require more focus and more attention. Um, and having a place that I can kind of escape uh, like this, where I can just be more expressive and free uh, to, you know, just enjoy the marks is really helpful. All right, so, and then also, you know, it's it's a way to can kind of experiment a little bit. 
So I'm st each mark I'm making is a bit of a practice. I'm trying to be mindful of uh, the, the quality of the marks. So now I'm just kind of rocking the, the, the pen back and forth. So I'm striking the paper with each pass, but it's like the scooping motion, I'm, if I exaggerate it. And then I can, uh, I'll change the direction of the marks, but I'm kind of stuck because I can't rotate the paper. All right, now I'm going to get back to this area here. I do want to build up a little bit of tone there. And now that I have some tone up here, let me back that out a bit. Now that I have a little bit of tone up here, I can come in with a, a contour edge a little bit more and it's not quite as harsh. Um, Oh, thank you for sharing that, Heather, your experience with the pen. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how it's, you know, how it, whatever pen you have reacts to the the graphite. Um, these these Derwent pens seem to, to work really well. These are kind of a small, um, kind of a felt tip surface, I believe, but they're really fine and there's a hardness to them. There's kind of a plastic quality to the nib um, that is that gives me a little bit of control. So as I move down in here, um, I want to kind of indicate some of these, these brow lines. And I'm trying to be intentional with varying my marks. So some are pushing, some are pulling. Some are more controlled, some are less so. Um, and I can come back in with the white um, colored pencil to get some of these highlights as well. Um, oh, Leslie, <laughs> I hope you didn't kill your pen. Um, Renda, yours, yours, look, yours look ang looked angry at this point. Um, yeah, it's a pretty intense portrait. Uh, observe the shape of the eyebrow here. Um, so this area here is is really critical. And if you look at some of the great portrait artists, people like um, you know Rembrandt, for example, they were really good at paying attention to these areas that recede away from us. You know, so when you think about how wide the forehead actually is, by turning to nearly a profile like this, you're taking all of that information and now you're squeezing it into a narrow strip on your paper. Um, but the more you can really observe the changes within that narrow space, the more depth you'll be able to convey. Um, so what I'm trying to avoid is an air, this area feeling kind of flat, and the way to make, give it more dimension is to really observe how it shifts from, you know, from section to section. Break that up into as many pieces as you can. And you're looking for variety. All right, thank you. I see some new people here. So I thank you all for kind words that are emerging. 
I'm going to give a little bit of an indication of that eyelid here. Um, and so again, I'm trying to, along those edges, be really mindful of varying those marks. All right, I'm gonna come back under, under here. Um, and being trying to pay attention to the, the pressure on the marks. And this is an interesting transition here. Where it's kind of soft on this edge, so I'm going to flick up to get those marks. And actually, then I'm going to kind of alternate and bring some down this way. So it's soft on this side and soft on that side. There are these really cool creases here on that eyelid. Let me zoom back in again so you can see that a little bit better. Kind of lifting as I round around the, the eyeball. So this is a spherical form really wrapping around the eyeball. And what you see here very clearly is the way the eyeball is set within the eye socket. Um, the eyeball is not centrally placed in the eye socket. It's actually set kind of a little low. So the eye, there's this eye socket here, and the upper eye socket is up here, kind of overhanging a little bit. Um, and we really see that clearly here. So All right, so how is everybody else doing? Anybody else really working in pen? Uh, I know I kind of sprung this on you because it's not a medium that I typically work with, so. Um, but like I said, this is, hopefully these are um, ideas that you could um, translate to other media as well. Um, and I find myself, I just, I really need to bounce around from one spot to the next. It's so easy to get absorbed in one area. And you can see I'm drawing with my wrist a little bit more. And, but I, part of that is the, the contortions that I need to go through. I really want to rotate the paper. Um, now, I want to emphasize this vertical nature of this part of the head. So I'm going to turn a little bit and, and uh, bring a layer of hatching that I, oh, vertically, that I haven't really incorporated much. Uh, so this area here feels a little bit harsh. Um, so I'm going to try to soften it with a layer of hatching that kind of covers over. Um, and I, I also know that I can go darker than this as I'm calibrating to the value structure um, that the, uh, the, the sepia is creating. Um, so I'm starting to think of these areas in the sepia as, as being black when they're not. Um, that's going to help me, you know, this is going to help me in the end by, to fill out that value range. Um, the other thing that if you're looking for a soft transition in your marks, uh, as, you're, as you're layering your cross hatching, think about the, the length of your mark, varying the length of your marks as well. So some short, 
uh, some long ones. Uh, Barb is saying I started with pen and had to add some wash instead of cross hatching. I may try a few different ways. That's awesome. Yeah, this is a great portrait. Um, the the link in the description, um, the, it'll it should be in the the file name. It has the the photographer who took this, and I can't remember if I got this off of Unsplash or Pixabay, but. I want to give credit to the the photographer here. Um, and I just I found for for cross hatching, like you know, um, you can fix things. Um, like the, just the more you layer, a lot of times you can fix things. <laughs> it feels intimidating because you can't really erase. Um, but if you feel like it's gotten out of control where you're just not going to get the look that you want, um, I think it's healthy to stay with it um, and use that as a way to experiment um, and see if you can discover new things, new ways of using that, that pen um, and kind of make that a, a test drawing rather than starting over. kind of work the kinks out on that that original drawing. So again, I'm, I'm trying to stay focused centrally here. Uh, I'm not spending a whole lot of time along the, the edges, building the form, and then I'll work my way out to the edges. I love these, um, these creases here, the way they're catching the light. In particular, there's one here that, that is really nice. And so I'm, um, when you're working on these creases, try to, try to identify the direction of your marks. I mean, whether you're going to push or you're going to pull your pen, because that can impact the edges of that. Um, and then I use kind of a, if I need to, kind of unify things a little bit more. I'll do a kind of a wash over the whole whole area. So the wash really helps to define the light and shadow of the large structures, and then the, the smaller dimensional hatching helps to create the the light and shadow of the smaller bumps and all the textures. Kind of getting a little bit lost in these creases, trying to figure out where am I. All right. Uh, I'll work down in here so, so I'm a little bit more on camera. Let's see, uh, Mary is working with Zebra Sarsa Clip. Awesome. Oh, Dita is saying a lot of people have done this photo. Interesting. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, you see a lot of a lot of portraits online. All right, I want to kind of squint a little bit to make sure that I see the turning forms. I need to make sure that I'm giving enough, enough attention to the, the large shapes of light and shadow. So this turn here from light into shadow here. Um, and not getting too absorbed in the, um, 
the, the smaller details at this stage. So as I work here, there's a, a soft kind of transition into that shadow. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of start in the center of that form and work my way out, gradually lifting as I go, kind of on either side of that shadow shape. One of the things that you know, working with cross hatching kind of brings to mind for me is uh, you know my times working in printmaking with etchings, um, and there's a particular quality that reminds me of these pen and ink drawings. <laughs> um, oh, and then Abby is working with a Pigma Micron, um, and Colleen is still using graphite. That's perfect. All right, so I'm kind of, I'm working my way down. Uh, you know, working my way down into this more, more shadow shape, but I need to be mindful of it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually work, start up over here on the nose more and then merge those forms. Um, so again, the, my big concern here is, that transition into the light. So I just want to be, um, I want to be mindful of my hatch marks to make sure that I'm lifting as I as I enter into that area. And this is just like it's just barely touching the page. Um, it's just, just so wild that that's what I like about with with pen is. You know, is that you know sometimes, you know sometimes it it feels like it's really grabbing the paper, and then sometimes it feels like you have to work for it. But there's there's like a I don't know there's um tension involved in working with pen and ink where you're like oh my gosh this kind of feels like it has a mind of its own sometimes. All right, so I'm gonna. So as I'm creating this, I'm being careful to land on the page gently. I'm gonna change direction. And then I love this. You can really see the shape of the nose. This, if you can start to identify the the various planes of the nose, it can be really helpful to adding um, specificity to it. So I see one distinct plane down here. Um, it changes a little bit up here, um, and we definitely see a change in planes um, right along here into that nostril. Um, it it we we see a a change in plane right in along here as well. So we kind of go back along the side of the nose, but then here it changes direction slightly.
And then as we work down in here, it changes the direction again. So there's so much subtlety in this form. And a lot of it, I mean, just simply being aware of those changing, those changing planes can be really helpful. Um, but you can you can kind of express them through, uh, you know, a variety of, of marks. So you don't have to necessarily think through exactly what direction you want to make your marks, as long as you know that um, at the various changes in the planes that you are changing direction of the marks, that there's, a, there's some sort of visual break there. So I'm creating another pass here where I'm trying to feather out that transition along the nose. Feathering that transition as well. And to create these kind of really kind of fine lines, I'm just leaning, I'm just laying the, the pen a little bit more flat. Um, so I'm just grabbing like the corner of the pen tip. It's a lot of a lot of focus on this one. This is an this is an exhausting drawing. You know, we there's a a certain amount of mental energy that's ex expended when creating art and especially as you as you embrace new media that your media that you're less familiar with it can be more exhausting <laughs> and that's what i'm experiencing now for sure and i want to turn the edge here um, so what uh, what that means is along this edge i'm just going to give a little bit of a a value shift kind of creating a, a light wash right over this edge and then I'm going to sharpen that up by bringing in some of that dark there. Um, all right, storage stover. I'm glad that you're appreciating these. I'd like to do more. It's a it's a really fun medium. Um, so hopefully I can incorporate more into the the mix. But we try to shake shake up the the media um, in this series. You know, I think this is going to influence my, you know, my charcoal and my graphite drawing as well. So, Ooh, okay. Now, this is the, this nostril here. One of the things that I found really um, helpful here is to to really pay attention to. The, the curvilinear nature of this nostril. It rounds out and then tucks back in underneath. Um, and so that, as we talked about earlier, turning edges are such an important aspect to this. It's one of the reasons I went with the, the vase drawing last week so that we can uh, approach the turning edges slightly differently using the white uh, charcoal on black paper. Um, but you know, rather than having a sharp edge here, there's a transition from light into a darker value, and then it gets darker still under here. Um, and if you look at this line here, I know that edge to exist, but I'm not going to express it because it's, it's all falling into shadow. So I want to be careful not to draw something that I can't really see. Um, our mind plays tricks on us, and we will often be aware of things that we're not capable of seeing and then incorporate them into the drawings. Um, so just be careful with that. So what we're seeing in here is a really distinct shadow. 
And I'm going to, because it's a kind of transition from light into shadow, um, I'm going to start with these longer, lighter marks. And then each pass is going to get kind of shorter and darker to create that, that transition, hopefully that, grade, that gradation that will work. Changing the direction of the mark with each pass. Um, and then we see that, that bit of the upper lip that's in shadow. But I, I think for me, one of the things that I really had to overcome was this instinct in the pen to create nice, clean contour lines. Um, and then if you're working down here, as we transition in the shadow area into the, um, the, the beard, um, be mindful of varying your marks there as well um, so that it's really easy just to create kind of a waterfall of marks. Um, but, you know, pay attention to the, the changing direction um, and, and vary your marks in there as well. And that'll add a, a layer of specificity. I'm going to create a bit of a turning edge here. I'm going to add a little bit of value. Actually, under here, I want to add a little bit of value under the nose. All right, uh, Mitzi, welcome. Glad you could make it. Um, if if you are joining us, what you're watching is drawing together. My name's Scott Meyer with Artist Network, and we meet every Wednesday to draw together. New subject. I try to vary the media, so this is working in pen and ink on this uh, profile of a man, and everything gets recorded. So if you miss something and you want to watch it back later, if you just like to watch and then draw along later. Uh, you can do that. It basically goes up as a recording almost immediately following the the shutting down of this event. All right. I'm just um, finding myself a little bit distracted here, so I want to bring myself into focus just a bit. Um, what I need to do now is round this. So we see a highlight in here and along in here. Um, and I need to have a, a kind of more distinct but gradual transition into this shadow on the cheekbone and then right around in here. So what I want to observe are the way the planes of that cheek change. So we have kind of one plane coming down in this direction here. Um, it changes direction right in here so I can change the direction of my marks and then it wraps around in here. Um, and so I'm just I'm trying to be mindful of those changing planes. And hopefully that captures it to some degree. Um, and then this all really, actually I wanna kinda darken that in there. This really all kinda starts to fall into shadow, so what I'm gonna do is create a bit of a value wash. And it's a really light, fine marks that build up, accumulate together. And I'm going to change directions as I go. Um, and actually, what I this is feeling a bit too harsh right now. So if I zoom out, 
what I kind of lock onto is this shape right in here, and that's too strong. So I want to feather that out a little bit. And so the way I'm doing that is kind of dragging, kind of lifting as I go, and then as I work into that form, gradually applying, applying more pressure. So it's working in and out at the same time. And this right here is too harsh. Um, so I can gradually refine that. I'll kind of work up to that edge and just keep building hatch marks. And what I want to be careful of is, is to avoid this area right in here. So darken this light area leading up to it. Darken the area on the other side of this ridge. Um, and, and do a a wash on top of it. I try to gradually smooth out that transition. So I'm looking at I'm looking at the uh, the overhead capture on the screen in front of me, and that helps me to analyze the work a little bit better. So if you haven't done that, it can be helpful to do that as well, especially with pen and ink. It has a um, has kind of has a quality to it that makes me want to get kind of sucked into it and stay right close to the paper. Um, and uh, so I think it's it's helpful to kind of remind ourselves that we also need to step back from it a bit. Um, and I still want to kind of smooth this out. So targeting this light area here. All right. Um, okay, Jane, um, I am working on, you're asking what pen and paper, I'm working on the Strathmore toned gray paper, and I am using the line maker. These are Derwent pens, so line maker, I've got the sepia. I do have a, a it's called a graphite, so it's a light gray. Um, and these are both the 0.3 in size, and then I have a 0 0.05 um, black line maker. I. I would have liked to have a heavier one, but I had given it to my son, and I forgot to take it back. So <laughs> he's been enjoying the drawing with it lately, so um, which makes me very happy. It brings me a lot of joy to have art supplies being um, kind of taken over by my kids. When I lose it because it's my fault, and I'm hard on myself, but if I've given it to kids and they're using it, that's awesome. Um, yeah, it only goes darker. So that's the other other aspect to drawing with pen and ink is that it, it kind of forces you to um, be mindful of the light areas. Now, we're going to be working with a, um, a, a colored pencil. I have a white colored pencil I'm going to be using for the highlight, so... All right, uh, now let's see here. I'm almost ready to bring out that colored pencil. I do want to give a little bit more structure to the forehead. I'm gonna, um, and, and that structure can really be expressed through these brow lines and trying to define those a little bit. Um, And I want to go a little bit darker in this area. And there's so many layers of hatching. I just love how it's so easy to just get absorbed in all of them. Um, I do want to, I want to create some lines that are more distinctly vertical along in here. Um, I feel like that diagonal pull is a little bit strong, so I'm being a little bit heavier with a layer of hatching here. 
um, they're, they're kind of getting lost, but I'm hoping that they'll accumulate together to reinforce the vertical nature of that, that temple. So now I'm going to go through and find these, um, these kind of shadow shapes in the creases and create them using more of these vertical marks. And I may have to define them a little bit more with the, um, with the black marker a little bit later because this is, this is getting pretty well saturated. But I like to kind of sneak up on those values So again, trying to trying to just provide a layer of kind of vertical marks to reinforce the vertical nature of this side of the head. So this is really parallel hatching what I'm doing here because I'm not, I mean, to some degree it's dimensional hatching in the fact that I'm kind of reinforcing one dimension of it, but um, I'm not paying too close attention to um, really following the contour of the form. And then I want to bring this into shadow a little bit more, bring the shadow down a little bit more. And then I'll have the, that, the, white, um, the white colored pencil bring out some of that white um, of the beard hairs a little bit more. And so this is a great practice for cross hatching. I don't think I've ever done so much cross hatching in a drawing. So, um, is anybody stuck in their work? Any, any areas that we might be able to help, or any insights that you might have gleaned from your own work that could be applicable to anybody else who's drawing? That's kind of what this show is all about as well: is sharing our ideas. Um, Sometimes we get on topics unrelated to the drawing specifically, but kind of tangentially related through our shared interest in art making. All right, so I'm just going to, I think, just lightly feather this out here. Uh, I want to be mindful of the time because I don't like to run more much longer than two hours. Two hours is a long time. So now let me bring in the white. There's a white colored pencil um, and let's see what happens. So I'm going to, I have it sharpened, but I'm going to use the side of the pencil and I'm just going to start with kind of a light touch and I'm identifying areas that are um, that are where the highlights are, but I'm not going to express them. So if, for example, I feel like there's a really strong highlight here. There's a strong highlight here and here. Um, what I'm going to do is focus really more on that transition into the shadow. So laying the, the colored pencil on its side, building up some light value. You know, in areas where I see a stronger light, but I, I want to have a soft transition. And by using the side of the pencil, it also um, it helps to incorporate the tooth of the paper to help kind of convey some of the uh, some of the, the skin texture. And 
I see a little bit of light here. There's kind of some bounce light happening. Uh, um, you know, we have the strong light coming from this side and just a slight glow coming in at a slightly different angle like in, in this area here. Uh, now, if you don't have a white colored pencil, uh, I think a white charcoal should work as well, or a white pastel pencil. I'm going to switch there. So I'm working on some of the more peripheral areas rather than the intense highlights. Um, and a smoothing out some of the gradations. And I want to be mindful of the, the various planes as well. So if I can use the direction of my marks to reinforce uh, the, the structure, that'll be helpful. All right, and along the bridge of the nose. Um, kind of giving a certain amount of sharpness to that edge, but not super sharp. All right, and then let's see. Now before I get into the hair, I wanna stay in this area here. There's a really nice light catching there on the edge of the eyelid, nice highlight here, a nice highlight along this ridge, that turn on that lower eyelid to capture that, that top plane. Um, it's a nice highlight here. So again, thinking about the turning edges, it's not the strongest right up against the edge. It's strongest kind of just inset from that edge. And as we, we look down here, you see the texture of the skin really helping to reinforce the rounded structure of the nose, the ridge of the nose there. And I'm going to work my way down. So this is all fairly light pressure with the uh, white colored pencil. And as I work my way down, this right in here is where the highlight is going to be. And I can really bear down on that. Um, and now it's not a sharp edge. I'm kind of feathering it out just a little bit. And then it feels like the, you know, there's a there's a structure to the ridge of the nose where it's kind of flat on front and then turns. Um, and then it's at that turn where the light seems to be a little bit stronger. But it's not like a distinct line. It's just along that path, it seems to catch the light a little bit more. So hopefully that gives it a little bit more structure. And as we come down in here, uh, there are these areas where there's some nice highlights. So starting with a light pressure to feather the edges and then bringing in a heavier pressure where the strongest highlight should be. Um, and it can be helpful to use the small, like a smaller thumbnail to observe these areas of light and shadow with a larger one. Sometimes it's the, 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 the light and the highlight kind of merge together a little bit more. Um, so right in here, this is, this is also rounded in here as well. So right up along that edge, it's light, but the strongest light is just inset from that edge. And that creates that, that undulating structure there. So and I do want to bring in some of that texture and along in here, along that, that cheekbone. Uh, 
And so this colored pencil, or if you have the white charcoal, can be a great way to soften some of those edges as well. Um, uh, Dallas, hey, so do I do you use gel pen in your drawing? No, this is a this is the the line maker, which I I believe is a it's a fine felt, but I'm not positive actually. All right. Um, All right, so now it's time for the beard. Let's see what happens. Um, so I want to first observe the overall light and shadow structure. So where is the where is the light hitting? Where is it? Where's the beard turning into shadow? And I think I largely have that. Um, but just like we talked about some of the rounded forms, like here along the bridge of the nose or right in here, the, the strongest light is not right up against the edge. There's a turn to it, so it drops slightly in value right up to that edge. Um, and so as I'm kind of suggesting some of the texture, I might apply a little bit more pressure just inset from where I envision the edge. Oh, right in here, I forgot to do this. This eyelid. All right. Um, you know, I mentioned this earlier when I was using the the pen. Um, it's really easy for me to just to get absorbed in in the uh, the mark making, and so I'm trying to be very intentional to only make one or two marks, and then move on. some suggestions of the light in the hair. And this, you know, by adding some of the light here, it helps to soften this transition so it's not quite a, as, as much of a harsh shape there. I think what I need to do, I'm losing the tip of the pencil, so I'm gonna use it on its side and block in some of these areas. And then you can create a, a sharp line by dragging along the length of the pencil rather than using the tip of the pencil. So I'm kind of just reacting to it. I'm not, not spending really a lot of time making sure I'm matching hair for hair. I mostly want to make sure that first I have a light and shadow structure that makes sense. There's a logic to it. And then here we see that turn into the corner of the mouth and then there's more light catching the hair that wraps up and around that, that cheek. And I think that's an important part of, of really capturing that structure. You know, even though the, the, the beard hairs are all irregular, um, we get a sense of that underlying structure that's being obscured. And um, the more our drawing can suggest that, I think the more easily the viewer will accept this as truth, so. And so rather than kind of prioritizing accuracy with these marks, I'm prioritizing gesture and light um, and hopes that it'll again be a kind of accepted as being looked at. And I'm just creating these fine lines by dragging along the length of the pencil. And now I have a sharp tip again if I need to um, incorporate some of that.
Um, uh, <laughs> why does my man look like a werewolf? I don't know. Oh, I look forward to seeing your work again. If you're new, you're going to want to know that you can share your work. So if you're drawing along, there's a link in the description to the show page on Artist Network where you can share your work. Um, and I love seeing everybody's work. Um, we're getting more and more people sharing, which is awesome. Uh, and not just the the hits, right? You know, some of you are being vulnerable and sharing work and saying, "Hey, this isn't my strongest drawing," but um, I really appreciate you all kind of sharing those. And I'm just going to kind of feather that out. Now I'm going to bring in the black black pen, and this should hopefully punch that contrast up and give us a a greater range in value. So bringing in some dark right there in the eye. Uh, right in here. Let me punch in on that. Um, and then I'm going to be, this is, this is a 0 0.05, so it's a very fine marker. And if I'm mindful of it, I can just kind of reinforce some of the structure um, without it being too heavy. And so I can add a, a layer of detail here looking for kind of finer creases, you know, in the nose. Um, I feel like it's it's darker right in here. So I can run a pass of these fine lines to darken that up a little bit. I can pull that, that out a little bit more. And I think I need to create more of that shelf underneath the overhang of the eyelid here. I try to spend more time on the structure of the eye. I really see the kind of the rounded quality of that eyelid. So right in here, I'm allowing these marks to kind of wrap up and around. Now you can see that I haven't really connected that across. Um, and I want to actually emphasize the depth and the shadow here a little bit more. Uh, and I may come back and sharpen that up, but I want to, I want to, I think, build up the structure around it more before I, before I drop in a line. Because again, I can't, I can't remove a contour line once it's established. Um, so I want to be really careful, but you know, whereas I can, I can smooth out a transition, um, I can deepen a shadow, I can do other things with the interior, the cross contour of these forms, but I, the contour marks themselves are, are pretty well fixed. Soften that transition. I want to kind of deepen this one just a little bit right in there. Really, really create that rounded quality by uh, pushing the contrast between light and shadow there. Um, and then right in here as well. I can reinforce some of these creases in here. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, Sophia, welcome. My name is Scott Meyer. Uh, this is Drawing Together. So we meet every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, Oh, the, the 
Oh, um, Kelly, I apologize for, yeah, this is all, all shaky. I apologize for that. I normally not, am. it normally doesn't bounce around quite as much with the charcoal, but I'm finding that with the pen it does. So I apologize for that. Um, and unfortunately I don't have a way of fixing it anymore. There's this, this table is about as secure as I can get it. Um, but I will try to be more, um, uh, delicate so it doesn't shake around as much. Um, so welcome everybody who's new. Um, so what this is all about, this our show here drawing together is people from all over just getting together to draw. So I, I find a new image each week to um, for us to draw and we try to identify ways in which that image in the process can help us advance our skills um, and we're on episode, what, 137, so if you, they're, they're not in any sort of linear progression, so a lot of people kind of discover it, end up kind of going back and just jumping in wherever, with whatever subject it seems interesting to you. So I'm, um, right now, this is pen and ink, I don't do a lot with pen and ink, um, but this is turning out to be a lot of fun, um, and I'm going to try to create a little bit more variety. I typically work with charcoal and graphite for this series. Um, get a lot of good feedback. I met people from all over the place. And uh, yeah, just a lot of fun. We've been doing it for a while. Good people, and you can share your work when you're done on Artist Network. And there's a link to the reference image in the description below. The description also has um, information about the materials I'm using. And all of this just goes up as a recording when it's done. So, um, all right, I'm going to zoom, zoom back. Actually, no, I'm going to, while I'm here, while I'm zoomed in, I'm, I'm going to stay focused on the nose. I'm bouncing around a lot. I apologize for that. I'm going to deepen some of these areas in here. So now is a, a time when I can kind of shift my thinking into sharp focus and be less concerned with how everything's holding up as a whole. And I do want to, I want to give a little bit more structure here. So right in here, I'm going to bring in more of a shadow core. So darken this area. And that what that should do is create more dimension in the nose. And this 0 0.05 pen is a great way to smooth transition because it's just so fine. Um, it, it softens things nicely. So right in here, I can make that transition more gradual um, using the finer material and then really push the depth in that shadow by bearing down on it more. Um, now, what do I wanna do? I feel like the, the bridge of the nose or this, this ridge here needs to be emphasized a little bit more. Um, I, but I think I wanna, let me zoom out. Let me drop in some value here. Starting at the top where I can be a little bit less precious with that edge. I can just build up layers of cross hatching. And I can I can go right over that edge if I need to. But I, I do like that. I like the that darker background here. So let me see what happens. Uh, I'm gonna kind of work my way down the length of the profile here. Kind of working up to that edge. Um, 
and changing the direction of my marks. Um, all right, welcome everybody. It's great seeing where you all the new viewers are viewing from. Um, I yeah, apologize for shakiness. That's typically not much of an issue. Um, there shouldn't be any focus issues because I have the camera set on manual focus. But yeah, zooming in and out like that, it's not something I typically do, but with something like this that requires, or you, I think you might benefit from seeing the close-up hatching. Um, I don't, I'm not able to move it a whole lot, but... Um, I'm able to at least zoom in on that central area. All right, so as I work my way down, I want to be a bit more precise. Um, what did you? Oh, that's interesting. I'm not sure, huh? Just some honest thing. Bouncing a lot is actually a good thing. It prevents you from getting tunnel vision. At least that's what a, a guy told me. Yes, I, you know, definitely for me, I, I generally recommend moving um, in your drawing from place to place rather than getting fixated on one area um, because exactly what you said, tunnel vision. We, uh, our understanding of subjects actually gets distorted the more we really stare at it. Um, so... Um, I'm running along. I'm supposed to be in another meeting right now, but I want to really finish this drawing. So I'll have to, um, I'll have to catch up with my teammates a little bit later because this is too much fun. Okay, so now I want to be careful here. So you can see that the hatch marks I'm creating are running parallel to the nose. Um, and so as I encounter that, I'm really lightening up because I don't want the directional marks in the background to become dominant uh, because then what that's going to do is it's going to flatten things out. My, the, the, the viewer's mind, my mind will, will associate these marks running in this direction as belonging to the nose because they're moving in the same direction. Um, and it'll be harder to visualize them as in being in separate places in space. And so to help create a spatial differentiation, um, I'm going to run the background marks uh, nearly perpendicular, but at, at a kind of a distinct angle to the, um, to the length of the nose. Um, and it, it may seem like a little thing, but I found that that can be really key to creating a sense of depth. Um, sometimes you can get the values right, you can get color right, but just the, by changing the direction of your marks, you create more separation between the various uh, spatial elements there. So. So as long as the marks there that are intersecting with the nose, I don't know if you can see it. I know I'm sorry for doing this, if it's giving you a headache, but I just want to make sure that you can see those marks. Again, that they are running noticeably different in their direction. Um, that should help pull that, that nose forward. And you see, we saw some of this in that Michelangelo copy we did recently, really him paying attention to the direction of the marks to create some of that visual separation. And now as I'm going to, I need to create some cross hatching, but I'm going to try to avoid marks again that run parallel.
And I want to give just a little bit more definition, some gestural marks here to suggest the beard hairs. More of that, more of that structure there. And I found that these pens actually work pretty well directly on top of the, the colored pencil. You know, it's not great, but it, they'll work. Uh, and so that's a really nice benefit. Uh, so now I'm just kind of smoothing out some of these transitions in value. kind of targeting the lighter areas to try to fill in those areas. And again, trying to change up not only the direction of my marks, but the, you know, whether I'm pushing or pulling them. I think we're pretty well done, unless anybody sees something that really needs kind of immediate addressing. Um, I hope you have all enjoyed this. Okay, kind of keep working on it a little bit. If there's any other lingering questions, feel free to shout them out. Um, again, my name is Scott Meyer. This is Drawing Together with Artist Network. We meet every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern, to draw together uh, next week. Sunflower, for those of us who have Ukraine on our minds. So, um, working on the sunflower. Thank you, Jackie, for reaching out. I think I found a good, good image there. And I got to figure out what medium I want to use for that. So, I don't know if it's going to be charcoal um, or whether it's going to be graphite, um, but maybe even the, the white on black like we did last week. So um, oh, and then Judy uh, asking why darker pen around the nose? So I've kind of darkened this a little bit again to pull that nose out. Um, if, if we think about the structure, this is farther away than this and then this is closer than that. Um, and so the more I can bring that tip of the nose out, it starts to create that three-dimensional plane, you know, we have this plane leading back um, with the eyes and the cheekbones and then the plane of the nose coming out um, at an angle. Um, and so to create that, it helps to have some of that variation. And then also it, um, yeah, it just, it helps to bring it forward. It breaks up that edge. Um, and the more variety you have along that edge, the greater sense of light and atmosphere you'll be able to create. And it creates a stronger three-dimensional effect. So if I really wanted to pull the tip of the nose out even farther, I think I'd, I, what I would do is kind of darken this more, create a higher contrast between light and dark. Um, I can actually kind of pull this area out a little bit more, the nostril. Um, And that's a, perhaps a bit too much, too much separation. So I'm going to darken that a little bit more. And so, yeah, again, it's just to kind of create that slight turn because it's not a strict profile. Um, there's a, it's turned slightly, um, it's closer to profile than a three quarter turn. Um, and then now I can um, emphasize just a few key areas to bring a greater level of sharpness to the drawing. Um, if And I could, let's see what happens if I darken this. So right now, this is really kind of blending in together. Um, I can darken this background a little bit more, but I'm actually going to try to separate it with more with a contour line and see what that does, see if that creates that, that space that, I'm, that I think is helpful to have. Mm. 
a little bit more depth right in here. It might be helpful. So now it's, it's, this could go on forever. I could keep tweaking this and adding little bits here and there, um, but alas, time is running out. So I wanna thank you all for being here with me and being patient with me while we try out this medium. That's crazy, but a lot of fun. I hope you give it a shot um, at some point, you know, even if you're, if you're not ready for it, if you still wanna stick with graphite or charcoal, um, you know, I think it's helpful to expand into new media, but you'll also know what's right for you and, and when you need to stick with something and really ingrain a, a certain amount of knowledge with the medium you're currently using. So um, there you have it. So I have thoroughly enjoyed this. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for being with me. Um, I look forward to seeing you all next Wednesday. Uh, have a great week.